This is a short video on penetrating chest trauma. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of penetrating chest trauma. As in all of these videos, all of the boxes are color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be clearing all of the boxes and talking through each of them one by one as we repopulate the flowchart. Let's go ahead and get started. When we talk about penetrating chest trauma, we mean things that are small and sharp going through the chest. So this is usually stab wounds and gunshot wounds. This is in contrast to blunt chest trauma, which you might expect after a motor vehicle accident or a very intense athletic tackle, for instance. So we're thinking mostly of gunshot wounds and stab wounds. Let's start with stab wounds. When you have a stab, you have the thrusting action of a pointed object like a knife or a broken bottle. The tissue is then lacerated and torn along the path of that pointed object going through the body. The depth of the injury here is usually greater than the width. When you get stabbed with a knife, usually the knife goes in pretty deep but doesn't create that big of a hole. So that's stab wounds in a nutshell. Gunshot wounds have this, they're super fast, they have a very quick missile that goes through the body and the tissue is lacerated and crushed along the path of the bullet. The severity of the injury here is related to the kinetic energy of the bullet. And if you remember physics, one half mv squared, the m is the mass, so the weight of the bullet, the v is the velocity, so the speed of the bullet. Those are going to be what determines how much damage you have, the kinetic energy, the weight, and the velocity. In any case, the tissue is displaced forward and radially. This causes cavitation and pressure, of, and pressure injury to the nearby structures. So dense organs are going to absorb more kinetic energy than your less dense organs. So you can expect your liver and your bone, which are very dense, to be damaged more than the squishy stuff like your skin or fat. In any case, stab wounds or gunshot wounds, you end up with these penetrating chest traumas. And the manifestations of these chest traumas can vary pretty widely. There's a lot of stuff going on in your chest. If you think about the layers of everything from your skin all the way back to your spine, there's a lot going on. And the, um, the manifestations depend on what you're breaking and how bad you're breaking it. So let's talk through some of the major do not miss stuff. This list of manifestations is not exhaustive and it's really just an overview of what you can see. So first on this list is cardiac tamponade. This is a problem when you have increased intrapericardial pressure from a very acute pericardial effusion. So the heart, of course, is sitting in a sac, and if you bleed into that sac, you're gonna kind of compress the heart. You're gonna have so much blood inside the sac, inside the pericardium, that the heart is no longer able to pump, is no longer able to expand and contract as it normally does. You can have other things that cause cardiac tamponade. So you can have other fluids in there. You can have cancer cells that grow in there. You can have an infection in the pericardial sac. But in the case of penetrating chest trauma, it fills with blood and that causes cardiac tamponade. The three classic symptoms you get from cardiac tamponade are hypotension, muffled heart sounds, and distended neck veins. The distended neck veins are essentially jugular uh, venous pressure, high JVP, jugular venous distension, causes the distended neck veins. These are traditionally known as Beck's triad, and it's a classic finding for cardiac tamponade. Other symptoms you can get are tachycardia and pulsus paradoxus, as well as pallor and cold sweats. In very severe cases, cardiac tamponade causes an obstructive shock. Obstructive shock can cause left heart failure and right heart failure. And I'm not going to list these out every time we talk about obstructive shock, but it's worth seeing it at least once. Left heart failure is when your left heart, your left ventricle, is failing to pump forward. So this will cause acute dyspnea and orthopnea because blood is going to back up behind the left ventricle, which means that you're going to have fluid in your lungs. So you're going to have shortness of breath and you're going to have difficulty breathing that's worse when you're laying down on your back because gravity is no longer helping the, uh, the, the fluid stay away from the majority of your lungs, so it's worse when you lay down. You can also have hypotension and subsequent tachycardia. Of course, if your left ventricle isn't pumping blood forward, your main blood pressure, your systemic blood pressure is going to be low. Because you have fluid in your lungs, you can have coughing and wheezing, as well as coarse crackles and rails on lung exam. You'll also have, because you have poor perfusion to your entire body, you can have weakness, fatigue, altered mental status, cold extremities, calamity extremities, and cyanosis. You can actually have a blue tinge to the extremities or lips if you have very poor cardiac output. 
Right heart failure is also worth discussing. Obstructive shock of cardiac tamponade can affect both the left and the right heart. When you have right heart failure, your right ventricle is failing to pump forward. So your main symptoms here are going to be fluid backing up back into the systemic circulation. So you can have peripheral edema as that fluid backs up into your lower extremities, for instance. You can have hepatosplenomegaly as the fluid, as the blood backs up into your spleen and your liver. You can have the hepatojugular reflex as your um, essential venous system, your inferior vena cava, becomes like a column of water, a column of blood that, uh, that's containing way too much blood because your right ventricle isn't pumping forward. So if you press on somebody's liver, you'll actually see that column of blood go up into their, um, into their jugular vein. And you'll also have jugular venous distension that'll be visible in the neck as well. Another problem following penetrating chest trauma can be hemothorax. This is when you have blood in the pleural cavity. So now you have this membrane surrounding the lungs. We previously talked about the membrane surrounding the heart, the pericardium. Now we're talking about the pleural cavity. So you have blood surrounding the lungs. This might happen if you, for instance, break a blood vessel that bleeds into the pleural cavity. So in this case, you'll have a number of symptoms, respiratory distress, dyspnea, hypoxia on their vital signs. They can, of course, have chest pain for all of these. You'll have decreased or absent breath sounds as well. When you have blood entering in the pleural cavity, that's going to make it hard for the lung to expand, so that can decrease your breath sounds. You can also have decreased tactile fremitus on your pulmonary exam. You'll have dullness on percussion because it's all filled with blood now, and you can have flat neck veins, mostly from the hemorrhage. If you're bleeding into your lung cavities, your pleural cavities, you're going to have less blood in circulation, and that can make your neck veins appear flat. This can cause a hemorrhagic shock, so you're going to have a hypovolemic shock from bleeding into your into your uh, pleural cavity, and your and your entire thorax is a pretty big space, so it can contain a lot of your systemic blood. Another problem with the pleural space can be air. You can have a pneumothorax where you have air in the pleural cavity, and this can lead to lung collapse. So this will have similar symptoms to hemothorax. You can have respiratory distress, hypoxia, chest pain, of course, decreased or absent breath sounds because that lung is collapsed and it's no longer able to expand like it used to. In severe cases, the pneumothorax can become a tension pneumothorax. This happens when you have a one-way valve from the lung to the pleural space. So with every breath that the patient attempts to take, they're going to be trapping more and more air inside this pleural cavity. So they're essentially squeezing their lung collapsed even more with every breath, and the tension will continue to build. So they're con progressively increasing the pressure within their chest. And this can lead to tracheal deviation because you're increasing the pressure on one side of your chest so much, your trachea is pushed to the other side. And you can have distended neck veins here because you have so much pressure in your chest, you have so much air in there that it's hard for even your blood to get into your right heart. So that blood is gonna collect in your neck veins. So it's important to differentiate the distended neck veins from a tension pneumothorax from the flat neck veins from a hemothorax. The flat neck veins are from bleeding into your chest cavity having low blood volume. The distended neck veins are from having so much pressure in your chest, progressively increasing pressure in your chest, that your systemic circulation is no longer able to get back into your right heart, so it accumulates, and it's essentially the same as uh, jugular venous distension. You have so much uh, fluid that your right heart isn't getting or isn't pumping forward. This tension pneumo can also cause obstructive shock, so you can have hypovolemia uh, from that as well, and hypotension and tachycardia, the same shock symptoms that you always see. Next, another uh, potential injury from penetrating chest trauma is tracheobronchial injury. This is essentially damage to the large structures of the lung. This can lead to shortness of breath, of course, sternal tenderness, and of course, just general chest pain. If you're getting stabbed in the chest, it's going to hurt. Characteristic symptom or finding here is subcutaneous emphysema. This is air under the skin. On the chest x-ray, you might even see air in the surrounding soft tissues. You can have hoarseness of voice or dysphonia as well, and you can have bloody tracheal secretion. The patient can be coughing up uh, bloody tracheal secretions. You can also have a diaphragmatic injury. There's a lot of things in the, in the chest, so we're kind of talking about everything that can be damaged. If you damage the diaphragm, you can create a diaphragmatic hernia. This is when you have bowel that's poking up through the diaphragm 
into the lungs space, into the thorax. So this can lead to shortness of breath, of course, because you now have bowel where your lungs are supposed to expand. This can cause decreased breath sounds if the lungs aren't able to expand fully. And in some cases, you can even have bowel sounds in the chest. So imagine listening to somebody's lungs and hearing their bowels pump through because their bowels are poking up through this diaphragmatic hernia. In addition, if your bowels are up, stuck through a diaphragmatic hernia, this can cause bowel obstruction, which can lead to really bad constipation, called obstipation, which is when you have complete inability to pass stool or gas in severe cases. Your spinal cord, of course, goes through your, uh, your thoracic cavity, so you can have spinal cord injury as well. This can lead to normal spinal cord injuries that you'd expect from anything else, so sensory and or motor disturbances below the level of the injury. Lastly, for this list, you can have fractures, such as in the ribs or vertebral fractures. This can lead to pain on pressure, percussion, compression, and inspiration. For instance, if you fracture a couple ribs, it's going to be difficult to breathe because your ribs expand as you take a deep breath in. If you specifically break at least three ribs in at least two places, you can have a condition called flail chest. This is when you essentially have a, an island of broken rib on your rib cage, and it's gonna move with paradoxical movement as you take a breath. So when you normally take a breath in a healthy person, the chest cavity is going to expand on inspiration. When you have flail chest from at least three rib fractures in at least two places, that flail piece of chest is gonna move the opposite direction. So it's gonna move in on inspiration, so it'll kind of contract on inspiration, and then it'll move out with expiration, so the opposite of what you would expect the normal chest to do. So that's why it's called paradoxical movement. I hope this overview of penetrating chest trauma and possible manifestations was helpful, and thank you for listening.